Okay. Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Sturm. You are here for my um, transmission series called This is Consciousness. This is part number three, my third talk in this series. And in this talk, we'll be um, covering the topics of the archetypes and the self. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat along the way, and I will pick them up and answer them as we go. Your questions are totally welcome. I also want to say hello and welcome to all the folks joining via Facebook. Yeah. So, archetypes and the self. Let's begin with some definitions. <clears throat> So the archetypes are morphic fields, which are embedded in the low causal realm of consciousness. The low causal realm of consciousness I covered in the first talk when we went through all of the different states of consciousness, but it's basically the, the level of consciousness where meaning resides. There are two kinds of archetypes. The first is called the causal archetypes, and these are the forms, ideals, numbers, colors, and otherwise eternal objects that have structured the cosmos from the beginning. They are the foundations and the basic building blocks of the universe that we exist in. Causal archetypes are not the topic of our conversation today, though they could be an entire presentation in themselves. What we're going to be focusing on is what are more commonly called the archetypes, which are the evolutionary archetypes. And these are the patterns of meaning and identity that developed together with humans over the course of our evolution. These include myths and deities. Evolutionary archetypes are basically symbols in the collective unconscious. They are universal, indefinable, and unbounded. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to be using the word archetypes to mean evolutionary archetypes, and I'm going to use it interchangeably with the word symbols. Because they exist in the collective, meaning no individual holds them, and we all have access to them, they are universal, and they're beyond definition or unbounded because we can't say this is where they stop and this is where they start because they're in this collective field. Also worth noting that the symbols and archetypes are these universal patterns of meaning. The myths and deities are specific meanings and stories and identities that go with a given religion or a culture. So the myths and deities kind of are the cultural specific um, identity or meaning that we put on top of the universal symbol which lies beneath. So, in the prior two talks, I have been following pretty closely to integral philosophy in terms of the states of consciousness and the paradigms of consciousness that we uh, evolve through. This talk is going to be a departure or rather, what I really hope is that this talk is an addition to integral philosophy, and it's going to, I'm going to say some things that I haven't seen anybody else say. Um, so integral philosophy um, is being spearheaded right now by a guy named Ken Wilber, who is an amazing thinker and writer, um, and he is really kind of setting the standard for what is in this space. So in a book of his that he wrote about 20 years ago, Sex, Ecology, and Spirituality, he took an entire chapter to debunk archetypes and myths and to, from his perspective, really thoroughly go through why they don't work and are not part of a spiritual or mystical tradition moving forward in the evolution of humanity. And the other writers and thinkers that I've seen in the integral space have kind of followed along with that. So myths and archetypes um, are not an active part of the dialogue right now. 
So I'd just like to start by looking at um, where he's coming from and what the issues that he raises with myths and archetypes are. And then we'll come back around and we'll look at um, how and why they could be useful or from my perspective even are essential to the understanding of consciousness and our development as humans. So here's a quote. The Jungian archetypes are for the most part the magico-mythic motifs and archaic images. They should really be called prototypes, collectively inherited by you and by me from past stages of development. Archaic holons now forming part of our own compound individuality. They come from below up, not from above down. And coming to terms with these archaic holons, befriending and making conscious and differentiating or integrating these prototypes is a useful endeavor, not because they are our trans-rational future, but because they are our pre-rational past. I agree, agree entirely with Jung on the necessity of differentiating and integrating this archaic heritage. And then here's really the conclusion. I do not believe that this has much to do with genuine mystical spirituality. So that's where he put it um, about 20 years ago. And in, his, in one of his more recent books, he doesn't go into any level of depth, but he recapitulates the same point. So I think this is where Ken Wilber is currently. If I were to look at all of the different arguments that he makes and summarize them, um, here they are, and these are really important things about myths and archetypes to acknowledge, so pitfalls. The first is that they're taken as literal truth in the mythic traditional paradigm. So if you recall um, from my last talk, the different paradigms of consciousness, there is a worldview in which we organize ourselves according to a myth. That's what unifies us. And that myth is divinely revealed from one transcendent truth. So at this level of, at this paradigm of consciousness, the appropriate way to understand reality is that the myths, the stories, are what literally happened. It's not right or wrong, it's developmentally appropriate. And it tends to cause some havoc for groups of humans trying to coexist together um, in the world. Also worth noting that in terms of Western civilization, the most populous paradigm, meaning the paradigm with the most people in it, the largest bucket of people, is this paradigm. This goes for Western civilization and also for the world at large. So if we are going to start using myths and archetypes in um, a modern interpretation or postmodern or integral interpretation of the world and spirituality, we need to be really careful because the way that most humans will pick them up and use them is as literal truth, which we don't necessarily want anymore at higher levels of development. The next is that the myths and archetypes they developed together with humans over the course of our evolution. And so whatever experiences humans were having, we kind of laid them down into this um, membrane, this layer of reality. And the archetypes that formed tend to be the most common experiences that humans had, not necessarily spiritually realized one because most humans were just having regular everyday life experiences, not spiritual realization experiences. Those are a lot of the myths and archetypes that we have access to. So for example, if you go back to um, Grimm's fairy tales, there's not a lot of spiritual realization happening there. There are more common experiences of interpersonal dynamics in human existence. Together with that point is the next one, that, which is that even though these myths and symbols exist in collective consciousness, meaning we all have access to them, it does not mean that they are enlightened. Collective just means collective. So let me say a little bit more about that. There are symbols 
one of the great contributions that Carl Jung made is he recognized that people across all different cultures and ages and throughout human history would have dreams with these symbols in them. And the symbols were common amongst all these different people. And these same symbols showed up in religions, myths, and archetypes, these religious stories. Even people living in civilizations which did not have a religious tradition, so for example in Soviet Russia, um, they still were having dreams with these same religious symbols. So the symbols, the conclusion is that these symbols exist in the collective unconscious, that there is a space that we can all kind of access and the symbols speak to us and we pull them out. So they're collective. They're not held by any one individual or any one culture or any one religion. The point, however, that's being made here is that just because they're collective doesn't mean that they're necessarily enlightened or even enlightening. So another example here, let's look at the story of Adam and Eve in, the, in Genesis in the Bible. So here we have a serpent who says, hey Eve, eat this fruit from the tree of garden of, uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Eve says, okay. She eats from the fruit. She says, oh, this is pretty good. Hey, Adam, try this fruit. And then God sees them and kicks them out. And forevermore, men have been blaming women for being temptresses um, and for leading men into sin. Uh, from my perspective, this is not necessarily, this is nowhere close to an enlightened myth. Uh, it's caused a lot of distortion and a lot of suffering over the course of Western civilization. So, fair point. And then the larger point that Ken Wilber makes is that myths and archetypes emerged from a pre-rational past, but do not access a trans-rational future. He calls this the pre-trans fallacy. When I'm evaluating from my rational mind, just because something is not Part of rational way of knowing, it's a more intuitive way of knowing, does not mean that it's necessarily beyond my rationality. It could be something that came up from before my rationality. It comes um, from below up in Ken Wilber's language. So this is a more basic building block that rationality is built upon and where we're moving to is an even more expansive um, post-rational or trans-rational way of understanding the world. So the myths are the childlike basic stories that humanity used earlier in development. These are his points. And uh, I agree with all of these, except for the conclusion that myths do not access a transrational future and the conclusion that myths are not part of a mystical spiritual practice for humans at higher developmental levels now. Um, but the pieces around taken as literal truth, representing common experiences and collective does not mean enlightened, I'm totally on board with. And so as I was putting this talk together, having uh, this laid out as kind of the foundation to push against and say, well, yes to all of that, but here's why we still care about archetypes has been great. So that said, let's look at why we care about archetypes from my perspective. I'm going to propose that there are, in fact, three developmental axes in consciousness. Integral theory recognizes two, the first two, which are the first two talks that I gave. So the first one is states of consciousness, and this is our process of awakening. We go from gross to subtle to causal to witness to non-dual. And the um, what our awareness is holding expands at each level of development. The second developmental axis for consciousness is the paradigms of consciousness. And this is what I talked about last week. These are our worldviews, and this is our process of evolving. So we go from archaic to magic to mythic to modern to postmodern to integral to high integral and in theory more beyond that. 
The third developmental axis, which is new that I'm introducing here in this space, is that we move through archetypal roles and we mature. So we go from child to adolescent to adult to elder. Now, it is true that just by going through the aging process, each of us individually in these human bodies is going to move from child to adolescent to adult to elder. That is um, part of, but not the totality of what I'm talking about. The archetypal roles are the archetypes, the roles that we connect to at each stage of this life cycle. So just to give a full definition here, an archetypal role is an identity that locates me on the human life cycle. I access my archetypal role through sacred space via the process of initiation. And I'll say more about what that is in a little bit here. These archetypal roles bestow power and responsibility for how I function within society and life. So when I connect with, you know, an, an adult, one specific archetypal role within the adult bucket, that shows me who I am and what I need to do and how I need to engage with other humans and with the planet. Here is a human life cycle according to Bill Plotkin. So starting on the nine o'clock of the circle here on the left, we have the initiation of birth. That's where we enter into this human life. And our first period of life is childhood. So that is um, our role or our identity. We then have an initiation at puberty. We go from there into adolescence. Question here archetypes, child self, adult self, sage self. There are a number of different names for this. And just hang in there with me because child, adolescent, adult, and elder are going to give way to the actual archetypal roles, which I'm going to cover in a moment. So you're coming right along. So we go from childhood, we have an initiation around puberty, which brings us into adolescence. We have another initiation, which Bill Plot and Plotkin calls the soul initiation, which brings us into adulthood, and then an initiation, which he calls crowning, to bring us into elderhood, and then the final initiation is death. So this is a cycle, and in a well-functioning civilization, you will have humans at every place along the cycle moving around through it. Child, adolescent, adult, and elder are the broader categories, but they are not the archetypal roles themselves. Hmm? Where am I going here? The archetypal roles themselves in most cultures and in Western civilization in particular are gendered. They're split up by masculine and feminine. So on the masculine developmental ladder, we have boy, hero, the man or the father, and the old man or the grandfather. The feminine progression goes girl, maiden or heroine, woman or mother, and crone or grandmother. These are the archetypes. These are the meaning-laden patterns of identity that we connect into. And when I identify as hero, that shows me my place in the world and gives me a certain set of responsibilities and empowers me to do certain things with my life. When I then move to man, for example, that create that brings with it a different identity, a different understanding of who I am, a different place in society, and a different set of responsibilities towards other humans and towards the planet and the earth. So our culture has broken these out by these two genders. It's not to say that these two genders are the only two genders. Um, other cultures have other genders that are part of their arch archetypal pattern. And my perspective right now is that over the past 30 or 40 years, Western civilization is working on creating a, another gender pathway, third gender or an androgen gender pathway. But that's not what's here now, and that's not what we've inherited from the past. So an important point here, 
at the plural postmodern paradigm of consciousness, which we talked about last week, the most advanced um, bucket paradigm that has created a, um, a stable base in our culture, there is a very useful and good program of deconditioning um, social roles, which includes a lot around sex and gender. We're pulling apart these binary ways of seeing other humans, uh, which is good, and we're, we're looking at what lies underneath. And what I will add is if we try to disassemble and transcend gender altogether, we are going to lose this developmental pathway, which is important for any culture to have. And it just happens to be by these two genders. If we build it out in three or five or however, whatever plurality of genders that works, um, great but we need a developmental pathway through the human life cycle. And so at this particular moment, even though we want to get rid of the cultural conditioning that comes with the label of man and woman, we still need these archetypes to help us understand our place in the human life cycle and in human society. It's a very nuanced point. The way that we go from girl to maiden or heroine, and from there up to woman or mother, is through the process of initiation. So I'll say a little bit more about that here. Initiation advances us through these archetypal roles, and more broadly, it's how the wheel turns. Initiation, by its nature, brings transformation. And this is a universal human need. We need to psychologically and also physically transform over the course of our life a number of times. That transformation process looks like going through um, a death and then a renewal or a rebirth into the next archetype. Um, if you Consider for a minute, minute, I think you will find within yourself um, that Western civilization has lost the experiential core of our rites of passage and initiations. I like, feel that loss in my body. There's a recognition that like, oh, we should have something here and we don't. So we do have some rites of passage. Like I was raised Catholic, I went through confirmation um, you know, the bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah in Jewish um, religion. Uh, another rite of passage that we have is uh, when we graduate from high school or graduate from college, we go up on the stage and we receive the diploma. Um, so we have some rites of passage, but the experiential core has been lost. And in indigenous cultures and all of our collective past, these rites of passage involved a very visceral death and rebirth process. And when I go up on the stage today and get my high school diploma and then walk off, something is changing for me in my station in life, but I'm not going through a death of the adolescent into death of my heroic self into a birth of my man self. That we do not have. Without initiation, individuals and cultures remain immature and drive towards self-destruction, disease, and death. We get stuck, we get thwarted, and we get kind of bloated at the place where we're stuck, and then it moves towards self-destruction, disease, and death. It's not a healthy thing. The cycle wants to turn, but when the cycle gets stuck, then it starts to die. So the process of initiation has three steps, and we have every right to think that this is itself uh, an archetype, a universal symbol, because we see it in all cultures across all times. So the first phase of an archetype is called the call, 
where we're in normal time and space in regular reality, familiar environment, familiar identity. There is a call. Oh, it's time for transformation to happen. Sometimes I find that within. Sometimes the call comes from external to me and it's external, like kicking me in the pants out of my house. So I take a journey and I cross a threshold to enter into sacred space. And this brings me to phase two, the ordeal. So within sacred space, there is a stripping away of identity, a stripping away of what is familiar and a getting down to just the very basic human element, no name, no role in our culture, no station, just humble, submissive human. And then at the center, at the, the um, core of the ordeal is a death and then a rebirth, a renewal, a coming back to life where we touch these archetypes. And these archetypes, because they're in the collective, are incredibly powerful compared to our individual psyches. And this power comes in, we access it, we touch it, and it bestows a new archetypal role, a new identity, a new station in life with more power and also more responsibility. We receive that, we become reborn, and then we take the steps back outwards, uh, recollecting our, our normal sense of self. We pass the threshold out of sacred space and back into the normal mundane world, and we come back home again, um, transformed, and that is the return. Um, just as a side note, because we're talking about gender here, and it's kind of interwoven in to how these archetypes work, from my perspective, there are three sub archetypes of how the process of initiation works. There's a masculine um, journey where we go to the mountaintop or the peak. Uh, there is a feminine journey where we go, where we descend to the underworld or we enter the cave. And then there is an androgynous journey where we go through a labyrinth. So that's just a side note. This slide right here on the process of initiation could be an entire talk in itself. And if I was going to give another talk in this series, it would, it would be this topic. But for now, this is just enough of what the process of initiation entails so that we can kind of see that we don't have this in our culture today to move through this human life cycle. We don't have a death and rebirth process to get from childhood to adolescence or a death and rebirth, a real ordeal, a rite of passage into womanhood and manhood to get from adolescence into adulthood. So in Western civilization, our wheel is not turning. We are stuck as children and adolescents, even in adult bodies and elder bodies. And so we don't have um, people administering the roles within our culture that adults would do to tend to children and adolescents and that elders would do to connect to the unseen realm and to the ancestors and also to administer these rites of passage. That's an elder role that has been lost in our culture. We're kind of stuck in the top half in an unhealthy way and that's how and why our culture is diseased and driving towards death, essentially. So, don't just take my word for it on this one. Here's a couple of quotes. Bill Plotkin, who created the life cycle graph that I just showed, he says, we live in a largely adolescent world, and it is in great measure a pathological adolescence. There is absolutely nothing wrong with healthy adolescents, but our cultural resources have been so degraded over the centuries that the majority of humans in, quote, developed societies now never reach true adulthood. An adolescent world being unnatural and unbalanced inevitably spawns a variety of cultural pathologies resulting in contemporary societies that are materialistic, 
greed-based, hostily competitive, violent, racist, sexist, ageist, and ultimately self-destructive. These societal symptoms... These societal symptoms of patho-adolescence, which we see everywhere in the industrialized world today, are not at the root of our human nature, but rather are an effect of egocentrism on our humanity. So this is the, the cost of being in an adolescent world. Another perspective on how this plays into the patriarchy from Robert Moore. Patriarchy is set up and run not for men as a gender or for masculinity in its fullness or in its mature expressions, but rather by men who are fundamentally immature. It is really the rule of boys, often cruel and abusive boys. For the most part, we believe human societies have always consisted of boys and girls more or less unconsciously acting out their immature and grandiose fantasies. Our planetary home, more often than not, has resembled the island world of William Golding's Lord of the Flies. Thus, our societies have, on the whole, opposed the realization and expression of both mature feminine and masculine psyche. So, from my perspective, the advancement through the human life cycle is not just uh, a cool thing that we can do with archetypes, it's core. It is essential for a healthy, well-functioning civilization. And right now, Western civilization, for the past several hundred years, um, Western civilization has almost completely lost that. When we look at the crisis that we find ourselves in today with consumerism, corporate greed, wealth disparity, poverty, political division, war, um, the ecological crisis of ecosystem destruction and collapse. Those are all the symptoms. Those are all the things that we can point at of like how we see our, our world falling apart because of our civilization. From my perspective, there are two root causes what is actually causing and driving our civilization to be unhealthy and to create these destructive and um, death-inducing patterns. Number one is we have um, individual and collective widespread trauma, which is untreated and which is perpetuated from adults to children generation after generation. Until we're able to address and heal and break these cycles of trauma, we are never going to have a healthy, well-functioning civilization. That's number one. Number two is we do not have rites of passage and initiation to move through the life cycle. And I'll put this one, to move through this life cycle connected to these archetypes. Because we have lost that, we are stuck in an adolescent world, which is going to be um, egocentric, consumerist, competitive, and which is going to become bloated and move towards disease and eventually death. Until we get our wheel circulating again, we are fundamentally going to have a broken society. And the point is not just in the Western world, but in the world in general. Yes, we now live in a globalized village, and uh, we all of us need this. The distinction that I make around the Western world is that there are still indigenous cultures which have this cycle, which have their rites of passage intact and are still doing this. And they are in many ways more mature <laughs> than we are in the quote developed world. So that's why I say Western civilization, but really the entire planet needs this. This is a crucial need. And so if we throw away the archetypes, um, we're missing out on this lever for how to get ourselves back connected into the cycle of life. So that's my first point, maybe the most uh, crucial point that I wanted to make. In addition, 
there are some other aspects of why we care about or why I care about archetypes that I'd like to just point to. Here's a quote from one of my teachers, Pamela Eakins, talking about the Tarot deck. Imagine that the Tarot deck is a pocket-sized symbolic universe that exists within the infinite symbolic universe in which we live. The Tarot deck can be viewed as a set of flashcards encoding thousands of symbolic data bits that contain and apply to our larger universe. When properly understood, each card offers guidance for understanding and constructing our symbolic universe within and without. And below here are a few images from Pamela's Tarot deck. It's called Tarot of the Spirit, and I work with it closely. The point here is that we can use archetypes and symbols to understand the functioning and the, the, the terrain, the map of how our cosmos works. And not just to get an intellectual understanding, but archetypes are experiential, they're visceral, they're immediate. And so by connecting with different archetypes, we have an immediate connection with the universe around us. And that's pretty useful, it's pretty cool, it's a thing we can do. In addition, uh, there are many examples of myths and deities being used in rigorous spiritual practice. So two examples that I will give here, one from my Catholic upbringing and the other from my Tibetan practice, which I currently do. Uh, in the Christian tradition, there is the practice of going through the Stations of the Cross, usually together with saying the prayers around the rosary. And what we're doing here is we are connecting ourselves with the story of Jesus as he went through his process of crucifixion, death, and rebirth. And that can be understood as an initiation that he went through into a greater station of universal consciousness. The death of Jesus as the individual man and the rebirth as Jesus as the divine Christ. When we go through the Stations of the Cross, saying prayers, seeing ourselves in this process, we are connecting to that initiation through sacred space. In the Tibetan tradition, there is a practice called Deity Yoga, where one sits and visualizes a deity. So in this case, I have Vajra Yogini, that's from my lineage. We visualize ourselves as this deity in exquisite detail. Every armband, every skull, the, all the different colors um, are visualized, and then the practitioner imagines that they are the deity, that they're, they identify themselves with the deity. And through this process, we use the picture, the image of an enlightened being, a Buddha being, to connect with the experience of enlightenment itself. And so, you know, I would, my suggestion is that these are two very rigorous spiritual practices that are useful in the process of awakening that use myth and deity. Just to give it a little bit more flavor, um, another one of my teachers, Reggie Ray, talking about the Tibetan practice. Through visualizing ourselves as an enlightened Buddha, even at the level of imitation, we are accomplishing two things. First, we are temporarily taking our concept of ego offline and rendering it inactive. This disruption of our normal, habitual, egoic visualizing makes room for something deeper and more genuine to emerge. Second, we are engaging in seeing ourselves as a selfless, compassionate being. And in the long term, we find ourselves beginning to identify with this enlightened image, the archetype. These two effects of visualization are referred to in traditional terms as the accumulation of merit. So there is in, you know, these are just two examples in many different religious traditions, um, a long-standing um, practice of generation after generation after generation of practitioners using myth 
and deity and then the underlying symbols or archetypes which are universal to connect to um, a more enlightened or advanced state of realization. And in fact, there is a universal symbol for wholeness. And that universal symbol for wholeness is the mandala. It's the circle which contains the all. So here's a mandala of the five medicine Buddhas from Tibetan Buddhism. The mandala in the tarot deck is called the Wheel of Fortune. And here's another mandala, from, which is the Aztec calendar, which represents time. All of these are a symbol for wholeness, for the wholeness of the reality that we find ourselves in, which includes all the different variety that we find within that wholeness, the many and the one put together. This is the universal symbol across all cultures, it shows up in your dream if you have a dream and the mandala shows up or a circle shows up. That is you connecting to the universal symbol for wholeness. By connecting to the symbol, we enter into the experience of wholeness itself. The symbol acts as a doorway. So just to recap, there are three aspects how we harness the archetypes that are super important from my perspective. One is they connect us to the archetypal role within the life cycle, so our process of maturation. This is essential for a well-functioning society and for us to mature and be healthy as individuals within that society. The second is understanding all of the functions of the cosmos. So the archetype of creation, destruction, temperance, karma, etc. And then the third is identification with and as the cycle itself. So number one is where am I within the cycle? And then number three is, and I can see myself as the whole cycle. So we use initiation and archetypes for species identification. I am one with humanity life identification, cosmos identification, or deity or enlightenment identification, connecting with these larger transpersonal ways of knowing ourselves. Hey, I now want to step into another point around the archetypes. And it's a little bit more nuanced, but it's really exciting for me. And for me, it's the core of why I care about archetypes, and it brings us to second word in the title of this, the self. Archetypes and the self. So in order to understand this, we're going to have to look at the, the psyche according to Carl Jung in a little bit more detail. Here is my doodle, my rendition, the different aspects of the psyche. So according to Carl Jung, the ego, egoic consciousness, is the totality of what I am aware of in any given moment. So the sensory experiences, the thoughts and memories, uh, whatever I can point to and say that is in my waking awareness or waking consciousness, that's the ego. We can go a little bit farther and say that the ego is the self-reflexive organizing sense of self within the psyche. It is the me that knows that I'm a me that carries my identity and my personality with it, um, that organizes, um, plans, uh, thinks through things logically. That's the ego. So in this definition, we can, we can say what is part of my waking consciousness and organizing self and what is not. And so this has a solid line around it. It is well-defined. Something is either in that bucket or not in that bucket. But the egoic consciousness is not the totality of my psyche. In fact, it's not even close. And I'm aware that there are other things in my psyche that are not part of my waking conscious awareness. And so all of that exists for Carl Jung in what he calls the unconscious. And the way that he defines the unconscious is the contents of the psyche, which are which I am not aware of, which are not part of my egoic awareness. 
So we go out the first ring and there is the shadow. The shadow is all of the places and parts and aspects of me that I have not yet fully loved and embraced and welcomed into my waking consciousness. To put it another way, the shadow are all of the parts of me that I have repressed, exiled, or disowned. In addition, there is a whole plethora of unconscious material, which is not unconscious because I have repressed it or disowned it or not fully loved it. It's just bits of sensory data that have never made it through the filter into waking consciousness. Um, different memories that I have forgotten, um, things that happened in my experience, but I wasn't fully aware to recognize them. So that is the personal unconscious and includes my entire life history of me as this human being. So the shadow, we cannot say um, this is the definite bound of the shadow because the shadow exists in what we are not aware of. Therefore, the shadow is unbounded and undefinable. You can't say this definitely is the shadow and this definitely is not the shadow. But we know that there is a shadow, that it exists kind of beneath. So there's a little dotted line around the shadow. And then the personal unconscious, similarly, we cannot define it. We can't say this is the totality of what's in my personal unconscious because it includes everything that I'm not aware of that happened to me as an individual person. So a little dotted line there to say roughly we know there's a region uh, of personal unconscious. And then as I mentioned earlier, there is this idea or experience of the collective unconscious. Collective unconscious is the aspect of my psyche that is beyond any personal experience that I've had. It's transpersonal. It's held collectively by all human beings. And these are the universal archetypes and symbols which I have access to. So the collective unconscious includes the archetypes. And this realm is vast. It's huge and incredibly powerful. Um, I'm one human. Right now, there are 8 billion of us participating in this collective unconscious field on the planet right now, with untold billions of humans also depositing into the collective unconscious before it. So that's like one tiny little pin is me in this vast field of the collective unconscious. The totality of this is, so this is the map of the psyche according to Carl Jung. Question. Personal unconscious. This lifetime or lifetimes of lifetimes? It's a great question. So Carl Jung, from his perspective, the personal unconscious is only what happens in this lifetime. Um, what I would offer, and Ralph Metzner, who's a, a thinker who I love, Include so any cosmology that includes um, rebirth, you know, there's a transpersonal soul that gets reborn lifetime after lifetime and carries forward karma with it, would say that our kind of soul level unconscious also comes with us and is a level together with but outside of the personal unconscious. So we would have a kind of transpersonal soul level psychic material with prior lifetimes like past life memories that come with it. Good question. Okay, so there's a dotted line around the big circle because we cannot define the, the psyche. It's, it's indefinable because it includes the elements of which we are not aware. However, the totality of this is what Carl Jung calls the self. And from his perspective, the self is an organizing center of consciousness in the totality of the psyche. So you'll notice that the ego in my little doodle here is kind of off and to the left. It's not in the direct center of the psyche. That is intentional. So the ego is its own organizing center and it works towards its own ends. My ego wants to be perfect. 
It wants to live a good, happy life. It wants to feel pleasure. Um, it wants to make itself into the, the biggest, most expressive version of itself that it can. These are the agendas of my ego. The self is not centered in the ego, but is the center of the psyche as a whole. It is a different organizing center with different agendas for what happens to me. Here is Carl Jung on the self. So we go through this egoic process and then we start to recognize that there is this higher self, this larger other organizing center within our uh, psyche. And so in that process, the ego cannot help discovering that the afflux of unconscious contents has vitalized the personality enriched it and created a figure, meaning the self, that somehow dwarfs the ego in scope and intensity. This experience paralyzes an over-egocentric over will and convinces the ego that in spite of all difficulties, it is better to be taken down a peg than to get involved in a hopeless struggle in which one is invariably handed the dirty end of the stick. <laughs> in this way, the will as disposable energy, gradually subordinates itself to the stronger factor, namely to the new totality figure that I call the self. So this larger, more powerful totality figure is the self. There's a different center within our consciousness, within the psyche. So the self is the organizing center of the total psyche, it includes all personal and collective aspects of consciousness. So the ego has its own agenda. The self works towards wholeness. And it works towards wholeness through the process of individuation. These are um, Carl Jung's words. So that is the psychological understanding of the self. And then we can draw um, some dotted lines and say, well, that lines up with the you know, in yoga and Hindu philosophy, Atman, the divine spark within. Buddhist terms, that is the Buddha mind. And Christian terms, that is Christ consciousness. And in talk number one, when we looked at states of consciousness, this is the pure witness realm of unity consciousness. Unity consciousness is the totality of the psyche, which is the self. That's what we're looking at here. Self works towards wholeness. So now let's look at the self's use of archetypes. Self works towards wholeness by reaching down to embrace the ego and in fact all parts of the psyche. Disowned parts, fragmented parts. Self is reaching down to embrace and integrate all of these different parts. We call this function, this natural drive of the universe, agape. So last week, when we were talking about the evolution of consciousness, that is movement from individuals towards greater degrees, we're reaching up towards greater degrees of complexity and wholeness. Think of the little plant growing up towards the sunlight. That reaching up is eros, that is the evolutionary drive. In complement to that fundamental feature of our universe is whole, reaching down to embrace parts. So the plant grows up, but the sun also shines down and beckons the, the plant and nourishes the plant to reach up. So that reaching down function to embrace the parts um, is agape. And that is how the self works towards wholeness. It reaches down to embrace us with love and compassion and kindness. So consider that from unitary consciousness, from um, the pure witness realm, stepping down, the next layer down is the causal realm where the archetypes live. And the next realm, realm down is the subtle energy realm. And the next realm, realm down is physical gross reality. So the archetypes are the units of meaning 
closest to the self. Archetypes, if we consider the self reaching down to connect to us humans here in the physical world, it reaches down through the archetypes to get to us. And if we just think for a moment, how has spirit or how has my higher self communicated to me? It often happens through dreams, intuition, serendipity, and in general, through symbols via the unconscious. Say that again, the self communicates to the ego, to us, through dreams, intuition, serendipity, and in general, symbols via the unconscious. And this brings me to kind of the, the exclamation point or the, the takeaway, like the punchline here. Archetypes are the language of spirit's compassionate embrace. So archetypes are the language of spirit's compassionate embrace. So consider that I'm on my spiritual path and what I can do as Matt is sit down on my meditation cushion and do my spiritual practice. And in that meditation, I'm connecting to higher realms of consciousness. And then I go to sleep at night and I enter dream world. And in dream world, then personality Matt is taking a break, is resting. But spirit, the self of me, is doing the self's spiritual practice of sending down messages through symbols into my dreams. This is spirit's compassionate embrace. And so then I get those messages and I try to interpret them and then take them and make meaning out of them. So there's a, there's a, a language, there's a, a communication that happens. And when I understand that archetypes are the language that spirit is using to communicate with me, then that gives me a complete reorientation to how I why I care and how I use archetypes and symbols. And actually coming up to speed on how to use these archetypes, how to find them in myself and interpret them and get those messages becomes vitally important. I would say equally important to receive the compassionate embrace as it is for me to do my spiritual practice and to be on my evolutionary journey. Equal, equal. So a few quotes to bring this home. Jeremy Taylor, there is a potentially unbroken continuity of experience stretching from the ordinary limited awareness of quote me, my seemingly small and separate waking quote self, all the way to a transcendent awareness of completeness and oneness and self-identification with the all, the divine. In my experience, all dreams, he's talking about dreams here, all dreams are ultimately aimed at this transcendent, direct, conscious, creative participation in the collective archetypal divine energies that are given shape in the cosmic dance of all life. All dreams are ultimately aimed at participation in the archetypal energies that make up the dance of life. And now, having gotten all of this orientation around what the archetypes are and how they relate to the self, I'd like to close this talk with a probably the most famous quote that Joseph Campbell made. He wrote, Hero with a Thousand Faces and really championed the use of mythology. Now we can like really fully receive the depth of where he's coming from in this quote. Myth is the secret opening through which the inexhaustible energies of the cosmos pour into human cultural manifestation. Myth is the secret opening through which the inexhaustible energies of the cosmos pour into human cultural manifestation. And in receiving those, we are ourselves enriched. So this is my perspective on what the archetypes are and why we care about them and how we want to use them.
and in the larger picture of how they fit into our understanding of what consciousness is and how consciousness is evolving or developing, what, what this path is that we find ourselves on. This is the more general talk about archetypes. Next week, I'll be coming back to talk more specifically about how different occult or secret societies or mystical traditions have used archetypes to create a pathway towards realization. I call this the mysteries, more specifically the Western mystery tradition. And we'll be looking at the tarot deck as a prime example of a collection of archetypes arranged in a specific pattern that can be used on the pathway of self-realization. That's what's coming next. I will open it up here, see if there are any questions um, that want to come through. Yes. Uh, would love it if you could include Eastern mythology as well in next week. It will be woven in in certain ways. That's why the title of the talk is The Mysteries and not The Western Mysteries. Um, but we'll be focusing mostly on Western mysticism because they're doing a very specific thing. But yes, I will weave it in to the extent that I'm able. So then... Uh, if you have other questions, type them into the chat. And while we're waiting here, I just want to say all of these talks form the foundation. This is the metaphysics or the worldview, uh, the picture of what we're doing in this pathway that I'm offering through um, Living Cosmos, which is my brand. And there's a six-month um, initiation into archetypes happening um, beginning in mid-March called the Lightning Path. So we'll be looking at both science and spirituality and archetypes to broaden our understanding of self and our role within this universe. So if you're interested in Lightning Path, you can go to livingcosmos.com and check it out. So with that, um, I will say thank you, everybody, for your kind attention and participation in this talk today. I can hang around for a little bit longer, so if there are more questions, um, feel free. And otherwise, um, have a beautiful day, and thanks so much for joining. Um, if I understand correctly, um, is it about um, that we getting the manifestation by meditating upon a and then the qualities of it, or is it the path for realization that we take one day to in terms of getting the qualities of the deity and then through which we can get enlightenment? Yeah, it's a good question. Okay, so from the Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist perspective, even though they work with deities, it is strangely a non theistic tradition. And from that perspective, it is all. The Buddha already exists within. It's all Buddha. So there's not like a Vajra Yogini out there who I need to go get saved by. Mm -hmm. But Vajra Yogini is a, a, um, an image of enlightened Buddha consciousness itself. So I picture myself as Vajra Yogini in exquisite detail. And by identifying with that, I'm able to connect with the enlightened place that already exists inside of me. She's a stepping stone, a translation from my normal identity to identifying with the all. So basically we are giving a visual form for the underlying enlightened Buddha within me. Yes, correct. Great question. Go back a couple of more slides. <laughs> There's more. Yes. Um, here? Yeah. Ken, yes. Can you say the masculine, feminine, and the androgynous part? Yes. Different audience. So, in the ordeal, if I am climbing up, if I'm ascending to the mountain peak, climbing up a ladder or otherwise going to the heavens, mm 
That is the masculine archetype at play in the process of initiation. Both men and women can climb to the mountaintop to become enlightened, but that's the masculine path. There is a feminine path of descent down into the underworld, and there are many myths of heroes or deities going to the underworld and having an experience. That's the feminine path. And then the androgynous path is when I walk through the looking glass, when I get lost in the labyrinth. So I'm neither ascending nor descending, but I'm entering sacred space by um, a process of disorientation on this plane. And I'm not going to do it full justice here, but I, I talk, talk about, about it more it. elsewhere. Yeah. So, I mean, are we probably touching about the self, the void, and the source kind of concept here? Or totally. Mm -hmm. Yes. The labyrinth would be the void, what you're talking about? The, the feminine pathway down is into the void. Into the void. Okay. okay. And the masculine part is of the source. Mm -hmm. We go up to the peak. You're welcome. Thanks for all your questions. Uh, great to have you, Venga. Thanks, man. Douglas. I enjoyed it. It was very good. Uh, I'm a doctor of philosophy, and I enjoyed it. I've been trying to uh, enlightenment for the longest period of time since I'm nine years old. I still haven't reached it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What I would offer you is that enlightenment is the core fundamental nature of who you already are. And the me that wants to reach enlightenment is the separate illusion of a self. But the, yeah, the more that we study this, the more that we dig into all of this information and then do the practices that go with it, the, the cleaner our mirror becomes so that we can see the truth of who we really are. Well, thank you for a beautiful uh, understanding. Oh, you're welcome. Pleasure to have you here, Douglas. Thank you for your share. Okay, so that is our talk for today. I'll say thank you, everyone. Recording stopped. Have a blessed day, and I hope to see you next week. Thank you, Matt.